part of the responsibility of that person was to uh, keep track as well as administer the fund and keep track of what the fund was doing. What we were able to do this past year in time for the last board meeting was follow up on all of the handball programs and all the people that we sent equipment to, sent booklets to, um, and find out exactly how many people they had Morning, the folks. Game. And how many programs You're part of there? USHA history yeah. now. And what You're we recorded. found out was, uh, as you know, we have 8,000 members. Some people think there's about, uh, most of us think there's about 50,000 real, real handball players in the country. And what we found out from the survey, we sent out, as it turns out, uh, 250 separate uh, questionnaires to people that had started programs or it said they'd start programs and it received booklets of information. We received back about a hundred, which was, we, we felt that just showed uh, a, a pretty good commitment. When you send out a questionnaire and you get about uh, almost half of them back, you know you're doing something right. Uh, they're, they're real happy to hear from you and they all had a lot of good things to say. Probably the most important thing is that out of 4,000 kids that had gone through those programs, 2,000 of them were still playing. And if you think about a possible total of 50,000 players or 8,000 members, and 2,000 kids, and this is just in the last two years of the people that have received equipment or have received information about the program, create 2,000 players in less than two doing for the the administrative person, first of all, it takes a big burden off me in terms of checking out programs. There's a lot of uh, legwork and just ordering equipment and getting the, the supplies out to people. So I, I thank you for that help. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you know that we're going to continue finding out some of the good things that we're accomplishing with the development fund. So thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to Bob. I'd like to thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, we've got some people who want to get out of here by 8.30 because they insist on playing in this tournament. I, I don't play much in it. <laughs> it's one advantage of not being a very good player. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning, probably, I don't know, 20 minutes maybe, 30 minutes at the most. If it goes more than 30, we're repeating ourselves. Uh, is first of all, just travel through the, the two-page stapled piece of information that you all should have in front of you. Uh, we'll just touch on some items in that. Obviously, you can you can read it, and uh, if you have any questions specifically, we'll field those at the last. Uh, anyway, we'll touch on that. Uh, then I'd like to uh, briefly look at some of the things we've been doing. Uh, John Bike was going to be here, uh, but I, I'd like to tell you all a little bit about the Bike Tyson Roadshow and how that went. Paul Williams is here. I'd like him to speak to the group briefly about his one wall efforts with the, the kids in New York City. And uh, we've got a, a video that I'd like to show you that was a result of, of some monies that we earmarked from the development fund last year to uh, try to understand what we can do with uh, TV technology. Uh, I think you'll all be very excited about it. And then we'll have a, uh, questions if you all have any. So that's kind of where we're going to go here in the next 20 minutes. Uh, looking at the highlights and summary, um, in terms of income, I, I, you know, I'm pleased that our contributor income and, and you people are, are hanging in there quite solidly. That's great. Our, uh, our income was about the same, maybe up slightly, uh, last year. Um, our expenses were <coughs> up. Uh, and I'd like to note, and I did in the, in the highlights here, if you look on the, on the budget sheet on the second page, you'll see that we spend a little over $17,000 in gloves, for example. I see that number being good. That means that there are a whole lot of people out there wearing gloves, and that means they're wearing gloves because they're in programs. So that's $17,000. When I see that, I just think of a lot of, a lot of little hands with gloves on them, and that's neat. Um, Vern, Vern spoke to uh, the subsidy. Uh, I'd like to take a, a in the like the third or fourth paragraph here. We're talking about the Bike Tyson Roadshow. Let's let's kind of hit those those highlight items. Uh, you know, John Bike and Pete Tyson for very little money uh, just really barnstormed the country last year. You know, they they started right after the nationals and they crisscrossed. I don't know how many thousands of miles they traveled uh, and how many thousands of people they really really touched in terms of, of handball. 
But uh, I know, for example, my uh, my nephew in Omaha, uh, never seen handball in his life. Uh, he plays down at the Y, basketball, etc. And, and they came into town, and, and, uh, and he was just all fired up. Boy, he had to have the gloves and the eye guards and you know the whole thing. So if he's any indication, it was uh, really successful for the kids that they did impact. They obviously uh, had a lot of people who, you know, such as myself, handball players, whatever, that came to these, but there were also a lot of new people. Uh, I'd like to say that if we, if we do that kind of thing again, I don't know if it's possible, but it would be probably more productive for younger people if we could do it sometime in the school year. It would be more productive for teachers. Uh, summertime was not a good time to hit up kids and teachers. They're kind of brain dead in the summer. Uh, and the other thing is, is that as much as they like to think that they're mountain men and muscle and all that, by the time they got to Denver, which is towards the end of the tour, they were dragging their little hands <laughs> and uh, very tired. It, it was just an exhausting thing for them. But well worth it from our standpoint, I think, and, and I think rewarding for them. Um, on that note, in the budget, uh, it does speak to six, a little over $6,000 as expenses for that. And I want to make sure that everybody understands down at the bottom there in the asterisk that uh, on our income, there's $4,000 that they brought in as part of their uh, work. So actually, the net to the development fund was a little over $2,000, uh, which is good. We authorized a maximum of $3,000. So in terms of money, we're, we're in good shape. Uh, another thing that I'd like to talk about before I have a call uh, talk to you is uh, Leon Tyson, who has really contributed uh, to the development fund and to handball all along and served on the committee for a time. Uh, I think you all know Leanne, uh, but she's an excellent handball player, and I think she's probably uh, as good a handball player as she is. She's probably better as an administrator and as an educator. Uh, she offered to become our, our school's program coordinator, uh, volunteer position, and uh, what she's going to be responsible for, I think, is working back with uh, Vern and staff and in terms of trying to get PE and the curriculum to introduce handball. And I think she'll be quite effective at it. She was, I, I think, very effective in Texas when she was down there. So really, I'm looking forward to what she, what she produces. And I'm awfully glad that, she, that she's volunteered to do this uh, and has committed to do it. Um, let's look here. I'm not sure there's any other things really on the, uh, on the report or the expense line items that I need to go over. Oh, wait a minute. There is one thing. Um, in the other category, you'll see a thumb in the can uh, for $12,000. Maybe a little explanations in order there. And uh, you'll also see that there's a $12,000 contributor for the thumb in the can. Uh, this, I think, is an indicative of what development fund seed money can do. As a result of the, the, uh, the video teaser that we authorized, which we're going to see here shortly, uh, a lot of people got really excited about handball and TV and video and all that. And uh, Ben Thumb is the fellow who's kind of instrumental in getting this all going. He's in the TV industry, he's a narrator and, and all this. Uh, he has successfully, number one, gotten a contributor to put up $12,000 <coughs> to film, which they already have done. I filmed it in May, uh, a match in, uh, in California, actually at Joe McDonald's club. And uh, that film is intended, uh, once they gather the additional funds from advertising or whatever to, uh, to be aired on television. I assume that film will also be useful for some other things. But uh, in other words, what I'm saying is from that video teaser, this is happening. And it's happening, you know, we're channeling it through the development fund. And uh, I think it's just a, an indicative of the value of what your money is, is doing here. Paul, why don't you take a minute, if you would, or, and uh, talk about your one wall program? And well, thanks to the development fund, at least we've been able to start bringing back some excitement back into New York, at least as far as handball is concerned. We've had a um, pretty good year last year. We were able to run about seven um, events for juniors, where we had about a little over 70 kids that participated in the junior handball program. Um, these tournaments were uh, 12 to 19. And um, of those kids, you know, we only had about half a dozen of the kids that started to play four wall. But that was more kids that we had playing four wall in New York City for quite some time. Um, we only had one club that offered us court time, which was Sports Center Rockwell Center, which was my home club. And um, with the results of the tournaments, 
and seeing how well the kids behaved and there was no trouble at all, um, we had four other clubs, which is Queens Central Y, West Side Y in Manhattan, and also the New York Athletic Club giving us free court time now. So we have a program for four wall kids. Right now we have about 15 kids enrolled to <coughs> play four wall at these clubs. And we have over about 140 kids that are playing one wall consistently in tournaments spread out through the city. And also with the interest that was generated, now we also have um, our yearly uh, 55 plus senior Olympics handball event that we're running that um, Assemblyman Howard last year latched on to us because of the publicity and wanted us to run that for them. And then um, there's a group called the American Athletic Games that wants us to run handball exhibitions for them from time to time, as well as some of the local community groups in the five boroughs, the really four boroughs. Staten Island really hasn't participated as much, but the four other boroughs in New York City, they've been interested in starting up some youth clinics for one wall handball and four wall handball. Um, so, you know, it's been pretty exciting, at least for the last year. This year we're running about eight more events and um, we're getting a lot more kids that's involved. And none of it would be possible if it wasn't for the help of the development fund. So I thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm sure Paul appreciates the, the, uh, the good hand there because he, uh, he's, he's relentless <laughs> in terms of what he's doing in New York. And uh, very, uh, very skillful, I think, in terms of maximizing the resources that he has and the dollars that he gets. And uh, you know, in terms of bang for the buck, uh, Geez, we, uh, Paul is just fantastic, and we really appreciate what he's doing. Um, Tom Lynch uh, had an idea a few years ago that uh, came out of a, a development fund little turn uh, that we took three or four years ago when we established our policy and funding, and having to do with funding of a, what I call the showcase events. Uh, in this case, in this instance, it has to do with the funding for the for the junior nationals. Um, as you all, as you all, I think are aware, at the at the junior nationals, we try to uh, uh, give the the players some travel expense money based on distance traveled and all that. And of course, then we put on the tournament and the cost of it. Um, we determined uh, three or four years ago that that the development fund should certainly be a substantial contributor to that, and uh, we are. Uh, but that's not the total amount of money that's necessary to make that tournament work. So Tom came up with the idea that has become the Joe Ardito Travel Fund uh, in terms of an additional fundraiser to try to make up that difference. And I think Tom wants to speak to us uh, this morning just briefly about that fund and where it's going and what we might uh, do here to, to keep it going and keep it active and, and maybe increase the contribution. Yes. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I'm sure by now you're all aware of what the Joe Ardito Fund does. Uh, I won't go into that at uh, this time, but uh, we're going to change the format a little bit this year in an effort to try to make the uh, fund a little more of a nation, nationwide effort. So what I'm going to do is to ask for some volunteers. I already have a number of volunteers, but the more the, the better. And uh, I will be contacting you and hopefully you will be able to get some support in your area. So what I'm looking for right now is uh, for names that uh, people who will volunteer to uh, help us get this on a nationwide uh, appeal. It's been a little bit more of, uh, certainly there's people all over the country that have donated, but it's been a little bit, probably 80% of it's from the Northeast. And uh, I think we can do a better job if, if we have uh, people all over the country contacting their friends, not just me. You know, it's, it's one thing if I send a letter to somebody and they don't know who I am. It's, it's, a, it's another thing if, if uh, one of you in uh, California contacts your friends and gets them to donate, I think we'll be a little more successful. So I would appreciate it if you give uh, anybody who is interested in helping us along these lines, gives me uh, your name and address or Vern. And, uh, I will contact you, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll give you an, I'll give you a copy of the letter that I'm sending out. Doesn't mean that that's exactly what you have to send out. You can send out anything you'd like, but uh, the object is I'm not looking for somebody to donate. We want you to donate, but what what we really want you to do is to get uh, a lot of other people to donate in your area. Okay, so uh, basically. We need some volunteers, so if you work there in a week before we leave, uh, if you're interested, uh, please give me a name and address, and, or give Vern a name and address, and uh, we'll see if we can get the Joe Ardito Fund uh, bigger and better than ever. Thank you.
Thanks, Tom. Uh, one item I'd like to, to uh, tell you all about is something we, we did yesterday at the board. Uh, again, it gets back to our showcase events, and again, it gets back to what the development fund is trying to do. Uh, we had uh, established a collegiate budget three or four years ago, and uh, yesterday the uh, collegiate committee chairman, which is uh, Tommy Burnett from Southwest Missouri, who wants that national championship to uh, stay there, I guess. Uh, he's very active, quite good. Uh, anyway, they, they made a, a very uh, thoughtful presentation to the board in terms of uh, additional funding and, and how they might use it. Uh, it certainly impressed me that that program is growing. It's grown the last uh, half dozen years. There are now some 11 colleges participating. That's up from about six I guess a few years ago in terms of the national tournament. And it's obvious that, that the collegiates are having some good success. And it's obvious that they, I think, can have some more additional success, not just with money, but with, with people and participation. So uh, they presented an idea, which was to basically increase their funding and, and presented some ways to use, to, to, uh, use that money. Uh, anyway, the, the result of all that was that we, uh, we authorized a modest increase in, in uh, development funds uh, for them, and then some additional funds out of the operating budget. But we're now uh, we'll now be contributing to the collegiate effort to the tune of five thousand per year, rather than the uh, thirty-five hundred, which we have done up to now. And I'm really pleased that that money is going there. I think we're going to see some awfully good things from it. Uh, in addition to just the, the college kids playing in the tournament. I think we're going to see some better ways and some understanding of how we can get some more programs going. So, again, thinking of development fund money sometimes as seed money and money that helps get something started, I think that uh, this is a real good, real good use of the funds. Um, I'd like to show you now a, a video. It's a video that, that you all paid for uh, <laughs> last summer. Should have told that after you see it. It, uh, you may think of it as quite an expensive show. It's, it's, I mean, you can watch several seven dollar movies out in your room. But uh, I'd like to. I'd like to watch it. That good, huh, Bob? Check out your It's not that good. It's about Hamble, too. Uh, subject. You got the subject wrong. Anyway, I'd like to. I'd like to see it, uh, and then and then I'd like to talk about an idea of where this might go and, and how the fund might uh, think of using some money uh, along the lines of video productions. If I to get up out of your seats and get come closer once it starts. You sure welcome to do that. <laughs>
featuring exciting footage of eight-time national one-wall singles champion Joe Durso and three-wall teenage sensation Jason Castro. In their own words, these handball superstars and others will convey their excitement and passion for the game. I'd say that basketball, swimming, skiing, and certainly handball are responsible for my good health at the age of 80. I can't think of a better game. Your own offense, your own defense, it's just great. Campbell, uh, for me, is uh, one of those uh, reasons why I get up in the morning. Campbell has some great women players, <laughs> but many women, and men for that matter, drop out when they discover the game can be a pain in the hand. Our videos will address that issue. We'll demonstrate the right ways to hit the ball, and we'll also take a look at this. It's Spalding's new handball, the white ball. It's softer and easier on the hand than the standard ball, and can play an important role in attracting more women and men to the game. Because handball moves so quickly, many people are unaware of the beauty of the sport. Our videos will slow down the action and let viewers see for themselves. We'll also tell the exciting and timely story about Tabio Tati Silvera, the current world champion. Tommy, with the help of handball coach Tony Huante, rose out of the L.A. Barrio to a pinnacle of athletic achievement. Handball is a sport that deserves far wider recognition. Together, we can light a fire in the hearts and minds of young men and women athletes to motivate them to pick up a handball, get out on the court, and find out why so many people have become hooked on the perfect game. Ready for another one? For how much? <laughs> From that, you can see a couple things. One is that the most important <coughs> aspect of that, I think, is it's uh, at least the filming technique and all. It's pretty damn exciting, and uh, I think. Uh, Ben has shown in that that you really can successfully film handball, and I think we can successfully film and produce video or, or whatever that will capture some people and will generate a lot of interest. Uh, from that, uh, like I said, the, uh, the thumb in the can and the idea of getting uh, handball on TV has, has, has uh, risen. That, that film is done. And uh, Ben Thump came to us. He's the, the voice there. The, the gentleman with the beard and the deep voice. He came to the board meeting in February and, and spoke about the documentary, which unfortunately, uh, as, as much as I would like to see that done, uh, it's just not in the cards right now. Uh, to do it well, and I think we, we don't want to do it unless we can do it well, is a price tag around $100,000 uh, for this half hour type documentary. So I, I think that that's kind of on the back burner at this point and something that we're not ready to plunge into with a lot of other efforts that we're involved with. Uh, but I think we are poised or ready to plunge into the shorter versions that he was talking about. Uh, in fact, he, uh, he has looked at some production companies uh, in terms of what it might take to put together a couple of uh, instructional videos, uh, an instructional video or an introduction to handball video that would be specifically geared to younger people. The idea of this would be to, you could send these out to people who wanted to start youth programs, you could send these videos out to schools, and basically they would uh, be another tool that they'd have to use to try to, to get kids interested. His idea at, at this point would be to do it, uh, if you think that, that that handball action was going fast, it would be about twice or three times that fast for the kids in terms of, of quick images, and uh, he calls it an MTV style, uh, whatever that is, uh, I guess kids like it. Uh, anyway, is that a radio station? the result of that, uh, in, in some of the production companies he's been looking at, it appears that we could accomplish both of those videos for a neighborhood of ten to twelve thousand um, dollars. And I think there's a possibility that he could do it for less, depending on the production company that he gets. But, but again, you know, I'd like to stress to you all, at least in my mind, in my opinion, is if we're going to do it, let's do it right, let's do it top quality and uh, do what we can afford. If we can't afford it, let's uh, wait until we can. But I think we are in a position to afford uh, something like this at this point. Our, our fund balance right now is around $30,000. Uh, it's been dropping a little bit. 
We obviously can't continue deficit spending forever. It will be the, the uh, federal government syndrome of handball or something. But, but right now, I think we do have that fund balance, and this might be an appropriate use of in the neighborhood of $10,000 of that. Um, I would like to propose that we proceed or pursue that, not proceed with the video, but, but pursue that and pursue it in the following manner, which would basically be uh, probably myself and Vern discussing with uh, Ben Thumb the specifics of the production, how he might do it, and really get into some uh, hard numbers in terms of budget and ideas and, and a proposal that the board could look at in February uh, and, then, and then make a decision on it, uh, how to proceed and, and at what pace and at what cost. Uh, but I, I would like you all to, to endorse that if we're going to do it. If you're not uh, thinking that that's a good use of up to $10,000, then, then I think it probably stops right here. So that's, that's the reason for showing the video, and I, I would like your, your feedback on that. Uh, one more item that I've got, and then we'll open it up to questions and specifically the feedback on the video, is uh, probably the <coughs> most important item. On everybody's table, there are several of these. Sometimes they're purple, and sometimes they're white, but basically it's a piece of paper that if you fill it out, it means money to us. Um, you know, you, all you people with your contributions are, are just fantastic. I mean, you can track these things, and I think Vern now puts in parentheses how long people have been contributing, and, and once people start contributing to the development fund, it seems like you all are hooked, and you just keep contributing, which is great. Uh, we need that. Obviously, we can't do these things without, without the money, and uh, we're dead in the water. Uh, so I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, number one, for you all to continue to contribute. And I hope that that if you do, that means that you're more or less satisfied with the general thrust that we're proceeding with. I'm sure any one of us could look at items and, and find an item that we're maybe not particularly happy about or satisfied with or might spend the money differently. But the overall balance here, I think, is, is pretty good. Uh, we need your contributions and we need your money to proceed with this kind of stuff. Uh, you're, you're the fund. You're the reason that we're, that I'm here, that all these programs exist. But we need that fund to grow. And I think the easiest way for, for that to happen, uh, short of you, you people's excellent contributions, is for, for you all to take one of these development fund pieces of paper and give it to a friend. Give it to somebody that you think might be interested in contributing. If every person here does that, then the fund will be healthy and in awfully good shape. And it's just real simple. It's kind of like the each one teach one idea here a few years ago. If everybody taught somebody how to play handball, our, our numbers would grow. And that's that's true. And if everybody gets somebody to contribute, then our numbers grow as well. So I'm asking for that for you to hang around. Take care of him, Mike. Take care of me. So uh, I'd like you all to, uh, to take that with you, and I'd like to to mention that, you know, I, I see the development fund uh, and what it's doing over the over the years. Uh, it was Ron Emberg's brainchild, and Ron is uh, Ron's a wealth of good ideas. And uh, the development fund is for people to give back to the game, uh, so that the game can uh, had to do with the, the building that was purchased, and that's the uh, uh, contribution fund and founders fund is called uh, for people to contribute to the to the building and, and be a part of that. And, and I know Ron came up with that idea. Uh, it's an excellent idea as a way for, again, people to give back to the game. And I know that Ron in no way intended for those two to be in conflict with each other. Uh, and I don't think they are either. I, I see all these funds uh, as kind of uh, contributing to each other. They all have to do with, with people giving back to the game in whatever way that they can. Uh, often, very often, people contribute to, to many of them. I mean, they're, some of the founders, contributors right now are the same people that contribute to the development fund. So you're obviously seeing various ways. But I just want to mention that because we don't want people to think that, well, I just have to pick one here and, geez, now that this founder's uh, business is coming up, well, maybe I ought to give to that and not the development fund this year. I would be personally saddened to see that that's the case, and I think Ron would be disappointed if, if that's what happened, too. Do you have anything that you wanted to add to that, Ron? This is true. Uh, but I know a lot of us can afford to do both, and uh, I'm asking those that can to do that. And I want to let everybody know that anybody that donates to the capital campaign 
is going to be recognized on a founder's wall, and it'll, uh, we haven't decided all the recognition, but it'll be a permanent recognition on the founder's wall at the headquarters. And uh, so uh, 5,000 donors will have one thing, and the other donors will have something else. But whatever we put up there will stay up there as long as the building is there. And so I appreciate your donations both ways. So along the lines of the contributions, uh, one thing that, that might be helpful for us is if you all have any ideas or feedback on, on how we might better recruit more people and, and contributors. Uh, you know, we try to, to do some good things for you. We do this. Uh, there's, there's the Grand Club. Uh, of course, everybody who contributes get the, I see several shirts and, and things around as the souvenirs that Vern tries to come up with. Uh, but if you have any additional ideas on how we might better uh, solicit contributors, uh, we're all ears. Um, that really concludes all the things that I wanted to say uh, this morning. So why don't we open it up uh, for questions or comments that you all might have, and uh, then we'll all dismiss and go about our days. I, I, I must say that the uh, piece of black in front of Bob Peters' eyes also was part of the development fund. Uh, we bought that camera to uh, record uh, things such as this. I don't know why Bob insists on doing these things, but he does. But more importantly, to record matches and some of the pro matches and the highlight matches from the Nationals so that we can develop a library of, of film that uh, can be useful, I think, for some of this video production and uh, so that 20 years from now we'll have the, the match when uh, so-and-so beats such and such and such and such was the, the big hoop to hoop. Uh, we don't have that right now. We're really mm -hmm. glad. Yes? Um, is it possible that copies could be gotten out to different parts of the country so that they could be shown in the high schools? These kind of tapes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. This, this video, let's say we... Uh, well, we in, our, in our area, we have a club where a lot of the kids that go to those schools already belong. And if they were introduced to this type of tape, they might come down and join some of these old fellas that are already playing handball down there and learn a few things about it, and seeing this tape would help. Yeah, that's exactly the idea. We'd have a okay. master made, Good. and then there'd be hundreds of these things that would be made to, to send to, to various places all over the country. Two questions, I guess. Uh, and I've been real busy up till now in the aerospace business, and anyway. I'm, I got, I'm retired. Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Rick Herrera out in uh, San Fernando Valley has is, is got about 70 kids playing handball at the junior high school at noon hour, giving up their lunch hour. And he got gloves and stuff from the from development fund. And one of the things he really needs is balls. And we, we give out a lot of balls, a lot of, and that's the question I have to ask, number one, are we giving out any balls? When I was a kid in the seminary, they gave everybody a ball the first day we got there. I think I still got that black ball they gave me. Uh, and I've got about 70 or 100 balls saved up in the South when we're right down the South West. The answer to your question is yes. Uh, as part of the programs that we do, Vern can elaborate if I miss something important here, but as part of the programs to anybody who's doing a youth program, uh, the equipment that we make available to them are gloves, eye guards. I see it as, uh, I see it as a pretty good way to communicate. Kids are visually oriented. Uh, we, I think we're all visually oriented. And I think there's evidence by how much time we'll probably watch TV probably too much. Uh, and I see it as just another, it's another tool. It's like a book. And uh, it costs money, but once we've got it there, I think it, it will be very helpful. So I'm, I'm taking that as a positive endorsement. Jared? Yes, one thing about the, the video is it, it shows a lot of micro views, but as an educator, you're going to have to show some macro views and show an overview of the court and an overview of the players instead of just the, the micro views. Yeah, because the beginners that see that won't understand it uh, as much unless there are some overviews included. Right. That's, that's a good suggestion. Playing for money. I don't know whether... Uh, well, that's kind of typically stuffy. Uh, <laughs> that's right. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't care about it myself, but I, I don't know the connotation. Might, uh, if it's a nationwide... Oh, yeah. No, I, I, uh, that's a that's I think we all agree with Steve, and I, I think the reason that that was in there is that when this was made, it was made in an attempt to take to potential sponsors to uh, garner some more funds to put, the, put some other it stuff. It was made for I understand. It was made for us. But I think yeah, I, I agree you. with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. Uh, 
rent or sell this thing, or is it we're just going to make hundreds of tapes and sell them? Well, I think the plan would be that we make locals. Uh, I don't think we intend to sell them. I think it would be part of a package that we could send out. Like right now, we send out the instructional books and, and all the concerns. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, photo shoot of our new Platinum 80 Plus Division, United States Handball Club. 80 Plus Platinum. Single. Hi guys, all right. Great. What a group. These are 80 plus platinum singles handball players. And if you don't think they're competitive, you ought to come down and watch them play. Okay, ladies, what have you got to say for yourself here? Where are you at? Do you know? Dottie, do you know where you're at? This is Dottie Yates. Oh, Charlie Yates is what? Oh, I think we're in Baltimore. You're in Baltimore, okay. For the Nationals, right? And we're glad that you have got your voice back. Thank you. <laughs> I second that motion. <laughs> All right, great. And the other two ladies are too bashful to speak, is that right? We're enjoying the tournament. Good, good. Happy to nice. it. It's going to be a hot, hot weekend, I guess. Yep. Glad to have you all here. Thank you. We're glad to be here. And here are the wives of the two finalists of the 80 plus platinum division. It's the first time we've ever had this division and won't be the last. Matter of fact, the reporter, uh, uh, what the heck was his name, uh, Mr. Uh, Buckley from USA Today said, what are you going to call the 85 and over? I said, the veteran, veteran platinum. And I said, no, in the 90s, we'll call them the diamond division. No, we have that already. <laughs> the sapphire division. How about with the oh, sapphire? Where are the, all, all the old bands? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you said that. I did. Yeah, Thanks, right. lady. <laughs> Here we are for the 43rd National USHA. Did you want a picture of the winner in the winner? <laughs> Not me. I ain't. How about that? Uh, Good to see you, Sal. Marty. Thank you, Robert. Here at the site of the 43rd National USHA handball tournament. Setting up for what the host described as a bull roast, which is an informal barbecue this Wednesday. Well, let's go inside and see if we can find a little handball. It's a shame to be inside on such a beautiful day like today, but. Whoop, that's not the name of our game. This is where we're going to play. 2076 Hardball Line. And this is some candid views of the crowd. This is really a great facility. They have 17 courts. Everyone has a glass back wall. And they have two exhibition courts. It's really great. Great. Excuse me. Oh, three hands. Look at this. On the left, Max Lasko. Doc Pajolo in the center and George Jackson. Good to see you back, George. Good to see you. Yeah, right, of course. You got commentary. That's it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Take care, Oh, what an ugly duo here. <laughs> Lovely ladies, two lovely staff. Oh, Don, don't be bashful now. And Mary Ann, doing a great job, ladies. We appreciate your help. Alec Drummond, Barry Beckley. Hey, Bob. Morning. And rules referees chairman, Pete Tyson. Uh oh, looks like my battery's gone. One of our helpers, Charlie Wicker. One of our younger players. Take a shot here of an innovation we have where we post all of the matches being played in the various courts here. Although we have 17, they're numbered 3 to 19 because 1 and 2 are no longer in use. But you can see this has really been a great, great idea. Court 16. There's a view of tournament control. I know why. And some of our helpers here. And there's a hand, Mike Meltzer. Mike was in the tournament. 
still have it, Douglas. In doubles, he still is. All right. Third partner. With his third partner. Oh. With Reyes, Zatali, and now I have legend from San Francisco, Mike Kelly. All right. He wasn't going to clip me. This is just a view uh, match. Hi. Who said hi? I did. Hey, the Canadian <laughs> contingency, Lisa Hello, Fraser. Hey. Bonjour. Bonjour. Happy to have the Canadians here at our 43rd USAJ Nationals. We're happy to be here. Good. All right. Happy to have you. Dan is one of our top pros. And he'll be playing soon. When are you playing? Serving nine. Danny, when are you playing today? I play at uh, 2 o'clock, John Bike. John Bike. Should be an interesting match. Are you ready for him? Yes, I am. All right. Ready. Okay. Good night's sleep, good meal. All right. You brought all those kill shots with you, huh? Yeah. All right. It's a match going on now. This is the uh, open single semifinalist. Ten, one. It's a quarterfinal match in the pro singles, serving of John Robles, Seattle, Washington, receiving Randy Maroney. It's a view of the uh, exhibition court here. As you can see, they have excellent viewing conditions. Really a great place to have an event. Point. Here's a view of the sponsors, one of our sponsors' booth. Alice and Linda Dudley. Two Four, serve 12. Young ladies. Hi, ladies. You want to say hi to the camera, or are you both bashful? <laughs> oh, look at They're running away from me. <laughs> Take a walk upstairs, see where we can find them. Made it, made it. The view, they're upstairs, lobby area and bar area. Get us, get us on the bar, yeah. Chris Watkins, Amy Paredes. We're the lone drunks. Having a glass of soda. <laughs> Kay Sleeper from Chicago. Hi, Kay. You can see how great this place is, all of the room. Here's a view of the upstairs level. Point. See, there's two exhibition courts with a common front wall. You can see all of the viewing upstairs, how wide everything is. It's Seven, really great. 712. Western area. Office area, big screen. Hi, ladies. The view of our Hall of Fame display. So each one of these courts has a lower level glass back wall. We're down to the semifinals in many of the events. That's why all of the courts aren't being used, but those that are, you can see our. There he is again, <laughs> Matt, Mike Meltzer. We even have a little ping pong here. We want to have a little divergence from handball. Okay, back to some more handball. A shot here, Paul Zafferano. How you doing? You enjoying yourself? Yes. Well, see, I got a pool, but I said. No, no. Oh, I understand. One of our loyal. I got a back rest and arm rest. How many nationals and do you think you've been at now? How many? Yeah, how many? Wow, I guess over 20. Over 20. Isn't that amazing? And we're in Baltimore. Where are you from again? Sacramento, California. Sacramento, California. How about that? And he also comes to a lot of the pro stops too, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I haven't played 15 years, and I this year alone I took in uh, Denver, Dallas, Concord. I was going to go to sport camp, but there's too many good local tournaments in California that I go to. Great, great. Uh, like I see Randy beat, uh, beat the David Worship, but that's till two weeks ago. Green. Wow. All right. Randy, Randy's going to be a long shot here. Okay. Out at the USHA has our own building. 
We're uh, trying to conduct a capital building fund drive to help defray the cost of the building as well as some of the interior work and remodeling and it's necessary so that we can do a proper job for a Hall of Fame. And at the same time supply a great working environment for the U USHA official. This is the view of the second level area. Over some of the courts here, heading on to the exhibition court. There he is, Eli Pickens. Huh? How you doing, Eli? How many tournaments does this make for you? Huh? How many tournaments does this make for you about? Would you... You know, I can't count that far. You don't know that. You can't count that far. Well, happy to have you here. You're a welcome addition. Appreciate it. Yeah, here we go again. Take a peek in here and see what we've got. This is the semifinals of the 60 plus between Craig Work and the receiving and Vince Gabriel. Control? Perfect. Are you enjoying it? What was that, Albert? I hear that. I think I have everything under control. All right, all right. It seems apparent. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. See you in Toledo, right? Absolutely. All right. Oh, there's Lisa again. Another ham. Wonder who that lady is there. Turn around, Elaine. Say hello. Elaine's got a dash there. Lisa's a little bashful too. Camera shy. Here's Tim at Manning his championship champion glove booth. I'm sorry, Tim. Yeah, all right. Make a deal. All right. Tim says, come on up, you'll make me a deal. Tim's one of the great supporters here, Tim and his company, Champion. We really appreciate him coming. We know he's got a lot of hard work and he's doing a great job. And of course, where would we be without our trainers? Headed up by Dr. John Aaron in there, got the baseball cap, and he's on his folder. Another camera shy guy. And Ray Kramis. Oh, Ray's not so bashful. <laughs> these two guys have been responsible for picking up, keeping all these guys going. You had a lot of business? You had a lot of business, Ray? It's uh, been a little slow, but off and on. Okay, well. A few tape jobs, a few. Uh... Shoulder Nothing serious this Nothing year. Nothing serious so far this year. Oh, that's year. great. That's great. We hope it's right. All right. Thanks a lot for coming, too. We appreciate it. Okay, we have a timeout. Semi or quarterfinal match between Randy Morones and John Robles. And I think you can see this is a very critical point. Randy won the first game. He has to serve now. He just scored his 20th point on an easy, unforced error by his opponent, John Robles. So, 
Let's see if Randy can get the 21st point in the match. Or whether Jan can recover, put him out, and force a tiebreaker. And like that. Okay, here we go. 20 20. This could be the match, putting Randy in the semis, or it could only be the second game. 20 serves 20. 20, 20. Good serve. Side out. Now it's John's turn. I'm going to call for a towel right there. Well, let's see if John can score the 21st point. Of course, a tiebreak. Here we go, 2020. of his full 20, 10 seconds 30, between six. to be in a fine players on national person. Are you enjoying yourself, Beth? Great. Great. great time. <laughs> How about you, Anna? I'm having a great time. Good. Glad to have you both here. Okay, we're picking up the action here in the third game tiebreaker between Randy Moronis, Jacob Rivera, California, John Robles, Spokane, Washington. 9-6, Robles favorite. giving Randy the serve back at 6-9. Oh, Quarterfinal match, 43rd Nationals. Floor. 
He hit it into the floor. match 7-0 in the tiebreaker. for the 43rd Nationals. It's really an outstanding place. And we're walking up. Really an impressive building, as you can see. Really a great place for a banquet. They really do a nice job, and the shot of the chandelier inside, which is very neat. Yeah. 
has all the earmarks of a Hollywood setting. Hello. Go inside and see what's what here. Do you have a badge? Three ladies. Wait, I need my sunglasses. Hi. Hi. Hi, Jennifer. Do you have a badge? I think we got one here somewhere. Do you have a And that's just walking in. All right. All right. Did you win today? All right. Allison's scratching her head there. Yeah. In our pal Val, guiding the door. It's Valerie Padilla. Go inside. Great place. Coming the along, there's the Tucson contingency. Hi, folks. Excuse me. Say hi. <laughs> Don't be bashful. George Dillon. This is the San Francisco table. Carol Black, Harry, Rudy Stadelberger. Stockton, California is Jack Tone. Say hi, Jack. Jack's absorbed listening to Bob Ned and his wife. Hi, folks. This is just to review the uh, riding crowd for our banquet at the 43rd National USHA handball event. We're going to have close to 600 people here tonight. And we're going to honor Fred Lewis by placing him in our Hello Handball Hall of Fame. Now well, let's get down to some meeting, and then I'll show you. the video camera. I'm, I'm not taking your picture. Alvis Grant, Dallas, Texas, Hall of Famer. Ken Conco, another Hall of Famer, and Mike Dow. This is my Marine Corps buddy. You, yeah, that's what I heard. You had a great time when, <laughs> when you were there, right? Great time. Mike, right. Here. You know, I, great I, time. I don't know where it is. I've misplaced it there. Am I the only right? Run it. And there's the fourth Hall of Famer, Steve Subag, Minneapolis, Minnesota, who's also the chairman of the National Handball Operating Council for the YMCA. Okay, here we are at Martin's West. And the shot of Fred Lewis is going to be honored by being put in our Hall of Fame tonight. His mother, Irene. And that's uh, Hall of Famer Lou Russo. Uh, hey, hi, Lou. How are you? <laughs> Tom Karowski and his son. Looking in here at a table of uh, one of our pro players, Charlie Khalil, Seacott Nance. Oh, it's Danny Bell. Here's one. Where's Danny? Oh, Danny. Hello, Danny. You guys didn't do it out here, huh? You know, you're not smiling, huh? You didn't win? You didn't win. Okay. Next year. Next year. Marty. Marty Decatur. He's here, too. Another one of our Hall of Famers talking to this year's inductee, Fred Lewis. That's great. I think I know this guy over here at the table. Stuffy! Hey. Stuffy Senior. First time I've seen him be camera shy without in the loss for words. You have to make it appear like you're not looking for you. Oh, I see, I see. Hi, Bob. Very nice to on. see you. Good job. All right. Good to have you here, John Blair. You're in the final, right? In the yeah, final. He, yes. he knocked me off this year. With her husband. Oh, all right, yeah. Ernie Virgili and Larry's brother Chico. Yes, I Good to have you here. It's a group from uh, my club. Okay.
those words were from Jack Horton. Hi, Jack. Hi. How, how the heck are you? I'm great. great. How are you? Great to be here. You having a good time, man? Eh? I'm having a great time. All right. Well, Helping great out. to have you here, too, Jack. Helping out. I'm very happy to be here. Good. I'll be here for the next 20 minutes. All right. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thank you. Illinois contingency over there. Kay and Bob, uh, Bob Sleeper. Big Sleeper. I'm Bob Peters. He's Big Sleeper. All right. Bill Easton, Norma. Moronis. Tiebreaker, right. Moronis won? Yeah. Oh, so we got in the bar ballot. Yeah, we got uh, Moronis and Chapman in the final. Chapman's also in the final of the open doubles. Too. That's great. Yeah. Bill Manning, he's playing in the final of the Golden 50 Plus tomorrow. Along with that motley crew from Chicago. Hiding behind. <laughs> hey, all right. Don Odito, Jack Carkey, Charlie Chavot. Neil Manning. <laughs> cool. The group from Detroit. Legends. Legends in their own time. Byrne and Dave Rod. Jim and his wife. Jim Golden and Paula Dow. How are you folks doing? We're having a great time. All right. Great to have you here. I hope you're going to be back next year. I know you guys keep saying you're not going to play anymore, but I hope that's not the case. You guys did win today, didn't you? Did you win today? Who are you playing tomorrow? Sleeper and his partner. Oh, the Daryl, right. That'll be a good match. Good luck. Jim Ryan, David Chapman, David's uh, our young phenom in the final of the open single, pro singles, and open doubles. And Jim Spark is good out. And there's infamous Art Padilla. Kenny Smollett is uh, taking a candid photo of Fred Lewis. Tonight's Hall of Fame inductee and his lovely family. While he's doing that, I'm taking a video of Kick. I would say welcome to the Hall of Fame. Although it's a little late, I wanted Vern to move this thing to Friday night so it would fit, but he just couldn't fit that in. The way these, uh, I learned a lot about the United States Handball Association and how it works. When we got into this, this tournament, I really didn't understand who does what responsibilities or how it works. And when the harsh reality set in, I thought it would be nice, there's a lot of people I've heard from your comments that really don't understand any better than I did. The way this goes, USA runs the tournament. They do tonight. They provide the money for the hospitality. The host people do the rest. And this was a revelation to me because I didn't, when we got this, I didn't know what the hell we were supposed to do. We put in a great package and then we tried to live up to it. You the crowd. We have a, uh, how this came about. <laughs> this is the third time in Baltimore. We've had two, the three, previous two times, it was a representative of Merritt and USHA. There were no handball people involved. So, the Mid-Atlantic chairman, who was Mr. Ed Jones, and I were sitting up at the Merritt one day, 18 months ago. I live 70 miles from here. I drive down here to play on some occasions. And you know, you handballers, but no, after two hours of playing, you can't go anywhere on an empty stomach. So we were up at the bar. There's got to be more beer drinkers out there than that. So Eddie said, I'm thinking about bidding the Nationals. And I said, Ed, if you want to do that, I'm unemployed. My wife prefers retired, but I'm unemployed and I'll help you. So we wrote this one glorious, fabulous letter 
of everything we could do. That's after Eddie got the Merit, Merit Club, which is, in my opinion, was the best in the United States. I got the hotels, we wrote this letter, and we didn't hear a damn thing. <laughs> so Eddie calls me one day and he said, uh, what do you think we ought to do? I said, the last letter was so powerful, we'll send him another letter. <laughs> Which we did. And I don't really think it was my power of persuasion through my literary efforts. I think Portland decided they didn't want to have the damn tournament. I remember a year ago I was in the hospital. I had, a knee, had my knee cut, I had an infection. I was released, I came home. I was half out of it. It was after the tournament in uh, East Lansing. And Vern called me. He said, well, you got it. I said, hell, I know that, how I get rid of it. <laughs> so, so when it finally came to me, why we did get the tournament. So then the fun started. We knew that uh, we weren't proud of what had happened before. And we wanted to do something that was going to make this stick out in your minds as a real activity. And to do that, we needed basically two things. We needed people, as people to attend. And we needed a draw. I mean, we needed money. So we wrote to every, every chairman, state chairman, east of the Mississippi. We campaigned very hard up in the Northeast. And the results were fantastic. I, on my part, am extremely happy that Baltimore, coming from nowhere, this time did the fourth largest draw in the history of the USHA. We wanted to do something special. This is a great bull roast uh, country, particularly with the people that are our friends, our handballers, the Nelsons. We solicited sponsors. Somewhere there is a misnomer, and I love the, these people, and they were a full-page contributor. The, the University of Minnesota did this. People just don't read. We love them. They were one of 11 sponsors. Now this is individuals and it's groups. And I, we, I thought we did a hell of a job last night and it's due to the people that helped. And anybody that's in this room who was a sponsor individually or part of a group, would you stand and be recognized please? I know there are people that are. Come on, stand up. You got 10 more? I know what to give it to that guy, good looking guy over at that table. Naturally, we have local people that, that do a lot. And the guy that has helped us. Uh, 20, 20. Is it my turn now? I'll tell you, we'll take numbers. You take the odd ones, I'll take the even ones. Here we go on even. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work goes into this. We had some real heavy hitters in Maryland. One guy who has helped us an awful lot. He's run tournaments. He's the chairman of the uh, the Maryland Association. I want to present him, Gary Zipper. Would you stand, please? tournament and we've all been to a couple of tournaments. People wonder how the hell you get everything done and it doesn't seem like anybody's doing anything. Well we have one of those people who does things and it's with great pleasure I present to you 
our real good friend and the guy that really works a lot is Dick Cat. Would you stand, Dick, please? When we went out for support in the Northeast, we got a lot of help. Both in the people signed their terms, signed their tournaments sign their applications, come to Baltimore, support the tournament. We have a new board member we're very proud of and who is a tremendous factor in the success of Baltimore. That's Tom Mitch. Where are you, Tom? You gotta be here. We did, uh, we ran a couple slogans and throughout the the publicity and the promotion. And before I head to our last one, before I sign off here, I want to introduce and present to you my partner, Eddie Joe. Ted, please. We've kept on top of things. I, I know we, people keep saying you can't satisfy everybody. By God, we gave her the hell of a shot. And our slogan, if you read USAJ, was come to Baltimore for the handball time of your life. Eddie and I really hope that has been true for you. We love you. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Good old days, guys. Thank you, Jim. Um, <laughs> this time I'd like to continue with the business portion of the tournament and have Carl Porter come up and talk to you. Our president of the United States Handball Association. Thanks, Vern. Uh, on behalf of the board and all of us, Jim Fahey and Ed Jones, we want to thank you for doing all that powerful letter writing and get us, getting us out here and putting on one whale of a tournament and all of the East for turning out over 700 entries strong uh, to make this the biggest tournament ever held out here. Thanks a lot. I'm going to be very brief. I have uh, about three items that we thought we ought to update you on from our board meeting. But before going into those, something that struck me here, and I would like to take one quick moment. You know, we always hear that handball is becoming an old person's game and that uh, the, the handball population is aging. And I think we dispelled that myth last year when we had our youngest national singles champion ever for the USHA, uh, Tati Silvera, who was, I believe, 20 years old at the time and uh, Nati Alvarado Jr. and David Chapman, the youngest doubles champions of all time. And then we come here and uh, we are going to have a new national singles champion for the first time this year. Uh, we just had the year before last, John Bike Jr. at the age of 25 was our national champion. Last year, Tati Silvera at the age of 20 was our champion. And in the finals on Saturday, we're going to have the youngest pair of finalists in the history of the USHA. And I'd like those two gentlemen to stand up because we'd like to recognize you. 22-year-old Randy Moronis. Randy. And 17-year-old David Chapman. David. Uh, I'm going to very quickly run over three items from some of our preliminary board meetings. We've still got another meeting to go, uh, but I thought here in the East you folks would like, to, uh, would like to know that we've had a lot of input from the players in the East who felt that our uh, regions, the Northeast region and the Mid-Atlantic region, were a little out of balance uh, in terms of where players actually play. So the board has taken action and we're going to redraw the lines on the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region slightly 
so that all of New York and all of New Jersey will now be in the Northeast region where most of those players play. And we're now taking Virginia from the Southeast region and moving up it up into the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, so that's something that ought to make the regional tournaments and uh, some, of, some of that kind of thing work a little better. Uh, second, uh, uh, second item from our board meeting that we want you to be aware of, and this is still in the formulative process, uh, we haven't ironed out all the details, but one of the things that the USHA really needs, we, we have about 8,000 members, we, we fluctuate between 8,000 and 8,500 members, we need to do something about that, and uh, Tom Easterling and, uh, has headed up a new membership committee. Uh, which is putting together a plan to run a two-month membership drive, USHA-wide membership drive, between October 15th and December 15th of this year. And we're aiming at trying to increase our membership about 8%, 8 to, 8 to 10% during that time. There'll be all kinds of recruiting uh, prizes and awards for existing members who bring in new members. We'll be discounting the uh, year member the membership fee for new people joining and we're going to try to put together uh, a series of membership uh, membership based tournaments all over the country in each region each area each city and all of you who are real supporters all of you who are organizers of handball start thinking now and we'll be getting information back to you soon thank you this afternoon, our pledges have already reached the $117,000 mark. Uh, Commenting about a we're, building. Of course, on. this is a this is a one-time, once-in-a-lifetime offer opportunity for all of us. The donors who do join in this drive and make a pledge over the next five years to be fulfilled over the next five years, all will be recognized in the Hall of Fame. They'll be permanently recognized. We're going to have, a, I believe, a donor's wall. Uh, uh, and according to the amounts that people donate, we'll have different categories of recognition. But anything you, if you do something toward this drive, your name will be permanently in the Handball Hall of Fame. Uh, this is something that is a one-time opportunity. This is separate from the development fund. Uh, this is not something to be considered as a substitute for the Joe Ardito Juniors or the development fund. This is a one-time opportunity uh, to help us give handball a permanent headquarters and Hall of Fame. And I know that something that uh, would send Ron Ember home really happy is if we could leave here on Saturday evening and Sunday with that mark up around $150,000. So uh, we hope everybody will keep that in mind. Uh, I, uh, Jaime? Thanks, Carl. Uh, real quick, this is a very important thing here, this Hall of Fame and this building fund. Uh, it means that we do have a solid home. It's like a Cooperstown or a Youngstown or whatever for the Hall of Fames. Out of my region right now, this is just a little challenge for everybody. Uh, California, Joe McDonald and myself got together with our regions, with our region. And uh, we're going to ask for the California people to stand up and donate for this building fund for the camp for the uh, capital campaign. Twenty dollars per guy or per person. Table 53, Jim Ryan, please stand up, will you please? We have uh, two hundred dollars out of that table. Uh, we will have tonight. We'll have runners going around, which is uh, John Bike Jr., John Robles, Danny Bell, Danny Armico, Nadi Jr., uh, Chris Watkins. We'll be running around, and Pat Silveri will be running around for your donations. Also, 
So California is, uh, we're putting a challenge out to everybody. You guys, we do need this, and uh, it's, it's going to a real, real good fun, and so we're gonna have a lot of fun with this, okay? That's all I wanted to say, Carl. Thank you, Mike. There's a challenge, and I can't believe that Texas or, uh, or New York uh, is going to let California out do them. Joe. Joe McDonald says we got $300 at this table, and I'm sitting there, and that scares me. But. In spite of the fact that we're on the East Coast in Baltimore this year, and up to 400, Carl got back to the table. That's a tough table to be. It's not all California, though. Um, there's 585 players in this tournament. 98 are from California, so I think we need to give California a big round of applause. Year in and year out. In addition to be the largest state in terms of membership in the USHA, they come back year in and year out and support the tournament. Okay, so if you're wondering where we're going to put this money, I'm going to ask Fred Lewis to come up and give us a report on our finances at this time. I think based on what just happened, uh, the financial report that I was about to give is, is basically obsolete. But uh, usually at the, at the Nationals, we talk about uh, the current financial condition of the organization. Um, 500 bucks to come here? That's all? You got all lucky. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jack. The uh, the financial statements for uh, the year ending December 31st, 1992, were published in the magazine a couple of months back. So uh, that's basically old news, and uh, really don't need to go over that. Uh, as of May 31st, uh, the uh, association was in extremely good shape. In uh, savings accounts and money markets, so we had approximately $150,000. About 32,000 of that uh, is set aside for the development fund. In other words, right now the development fund has about $32,000 to spend over the next year or so. In addition to cash, uh, we also own some stock. We had stock donated a couple of years ago, Procter & Gamble stock. And uh, the market value of that stock right now is somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or $8,000. As uh, as you all know, we also have a new asset, which is uh, our building. And the building was purchased a couple months ago. And uh, right now, we owe $80,000 on the building. That note will become due in five years, and we hope to be able to pay it off without having to roll it over. And uh, that's what this campaign is all about. One individual that uh, I think we, we need to recognize at this point is uh, a great handball player by the name of Neil Manning. Neil Manning is from Tucson. Neil Manning is also one of the top realtors in Tucson and was primary, primarily instrumental in us acquiring this, uh, this property. Uh, Neil was generous enough to uh, donate his commission to the building fund and I just want everybody to know that. Neil, if you're here, can you please stand up and I'd like to have you recognize it.
you know, if you, if you live in Tucson, if you live in Tucson, you get to drive by the building occasionally, and it's it's really it's something to behold. It still needs a little work on the inside. We need some carpeting, furniture, and whatnot. But uh, we invite you all to Tucson once uh, once we get the building uh, up to snuff at 100 percent, because uh, it'll bring a tear to your eye when you drive up there and you see our logo and you see USHA plaster across the front of the building. Uh, as Jaime said, we've got a home now and uh, we want to continue. We expect to have another good year. And as we accumulate additional funds, we hope to be able to do more for the game of handball. Uh, early in this evening, my brother, uh, who's not active in the organization, uh, this is the first tournament he's been to in uh, something like 25 years. Last one was at the University of Texas, and he took a look around this room and he said, Anybody who thinks that handball is dying is crazy. And uh, we all know that, and we want uh, the rest of the country to know that. We want to put this game on the map uh, within the next five or ten years. So just keep up the good work, and uh, hopefully we can report next year that things are moving along at, uh, at the same great pace. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. Uh, what's the guy from Albuquerque? <laughs> As most of you know, um, we, we've had a couple of good years, and um, one of the main reasons for that are some of the people that come here and help out every year at the tournament. They donate their time, and they make uh, they make the tournament easy for all of us players. And if you've ever run a tournament, you know how much fun it is to come and play and also help run a tournament. And it, actually, there's, there's definitely too many people to recognize here, but the team that Bob Peters puts together, um, every year in and year out, it's a pleasure to work with them. And um, I can't thank them enough for coming here and spending their week with us. They take a week of vacation. Some of them don't even play. They're here to just work the tournament. They enjoy it that much. I don't know why after they sit behind the table for a few hours, but they do that. And I thank them all. And, uh, I hope we can we can make it worth their while to keep coming back to the Nationals because it sure makes it easy for all the players. Um, how about yeah? How about all the workers just standing up for a second? Hey! Like Pete Tyson, Pat Hayes, Charlie Brown, hey. Many, many more. Um, of course, we have to thank the Eastern players who came out this year to support the tournament. And every year, as most of you may know, this is also our bus annual business meeting, and this is when we elect our um, new board members to the United States Handball Association. Each year, every region, the three three regional directors and two at-large members are um, elected at this meeting and they serve a term of three years. And for the regional directors, a ballot is sent out to every member in the region. They come back to the office. Uh, we, we send out a, uh, basically a postage paid return envelope, so the returns are, are very, very good. And we have um, we had a very, very strong slate in all three regions this year. And actually, all the people that volunteered to serve on the board, because I want to remind the board that our, our last meeting for this week is 7.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. Um, all the people that even offer to run for the board are very, very dedicated handballers, and they're dedicated to the sport. They serve, they come here on their own, and they volunteer the time. But anyhow, in the, um, in the at-large positions, I'd like to ask the, our, our slate of nominees to stand up. And, that would include Jerry Lee Hall from Des Moines as an at-large member. Very good. And Ron Ember from Texas is an at-large member. In the Mid-America region, um, someone who has served on the board actually for the last, I think it's been six years now maybe, maybe just three years, but he's worked very, very hard and uh, has been a real asset to the board, decided not to run this year. Bob Lomkiller, are you here? Bob decided not to run, 
Yeah. We had three very strong candidates running here. Rod Fink, I know, ran, and um, Mike Tanner. And I think the other candidate was Tim Zender, who's also one of our workers here. But anyhow, Mike Tanner, if you're in the room, would you stand up? <clears throat> then in the Mid-America region, Tom Carkey elected to run again, and also running with Tom from, um, I'm sorry, in the Central region. Tom Carkey was from the Central region. Jim Cosentino also ran, and the other candidate was, who? From the Central region? In, who? Charlie Keller from Milwaukee, I know he's not here. But anyhow, uh, Tom Carkey would stand up. And then in the Rocky Mountain region, our own in Tucson here, Bob Hickman is in the room, I believe. He'd stand up. And then also running from the Rocky Mountain region, we had from Tucson, Jim O'Brien, and from Albuquerque, Bob Sanchez. I'd like to thank those guys for also running. At this time, I'd like to recommend that we elect the slate of directors that would include Tom Carkey in the Central, Mike Tanner in the Mid-America, Bob Hickman in the Rocky Mountain, and our at-large nominees would be Jerry Lee Hall and Ron Ember. So I have a second. Second. All, all in favor? Aye. All opposed. Okay, that was pretty easy. I'd like to thank those guys, and, and would they please show up tomorrow at 7.30 for some fun. <laughs> um, fairly quickly now, I'd like to go into some of uh, the events for next year that I know you'll all be interested in. Of course, the end of the summer, we've already had our one-wall event, but our next outdoor event will be held in Toledo, Ohio. I believe it's about the 18th year we'll be back in Toledo. Great site. We'll have our national juniors in Chicago at the home of Don Quinlan's not off YMCA displays Illinois Junior Program, and then we'll be uh, servicing our California members pretty nicely next year. We'll have our Masters singles in San Diego, from about April. We'll have our Masters doubles at the Olympic Club in San Francisco in February. And then we'll have our collegiates in Portland, Oregon at the Multnomah Athletic Club. It'll be hosted by um, the Multnomah Athletic Club, but Pacific University will actually be the host. And then I know, I, I know we have a nice presentation um, each year. We try to announce where our next year's tournament will be held. And we're going to try and get ahead of the schedule a little bit so that you can make plans and so that our hosts can make plans. We found out from Mr. Fahey this year and from some other of our other hosts, they need more than a year to go out and try and raise the money it takes to host a national tournament and make some of the plans that are necessary. So I know Jim Terman would like to say a few words to you about next year's tournament. So I'm afraid while Jim's walking up, I just got something to say. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we just did in just a short period of time. Uh, table 34, Kevin Delagrand, Marty Goffstein, $540 out of that table. A total tonight, ladies and gentlemen, of $3,000. Very enthusiastic. Thanks very much. We're going, uh, going to places that we've never been before. Thanks. I think I need to thank Jaime and, and uh, I guess all the pros that were behind some of that. So that, that's nice to see. Thanks, guys. Thanks uh, for the introduction, Jaime. I appreciate it. How do you follow that? What are friends for? Players, members, and friends of the United States uh, Handball Association, good evening. It is our pleasure and privilege to be here tonight on behalf of the state of Minnesota, the members of our handball community. I want to thank you for choosing us as your site for the 44th National Handball Championships at the University of Minnesota. The last national championships in Minnesota were held in Minneapolis in the early 1930s. So we're long overdue. This is a great opportunity to showcase our game in the Upper Midwest. We appreciate it. 
and will show you a great time. At this time, it is my privilege to introduce to you the chair of next year's host committee, Barry Becklin, who will tell you more about what's in store for you in June of 1994. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you, players of the United States Handball Association. As chair of the host committee, we want to make your stay at next year's nationals in the Twin Cities one that you'll never forget. The University of Minnesota, the Minnesota State Handball Association, and the handball players within the state are committed to serving your handball and entertainment needs throughout your stay with us while in Minnesota. We encourage you to bring your spouse and family with you to the vacation land of the upper Midwest, the land of 10,000 lakes and the home of the headwaters of the Mississippi. The Twin Cities is a metro area of about two million people with cultural, recreational, and vacation opportunities waiting for you before, during, and after your stay at the national championships. The Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport, headquarters for Northwest Airlines, along with service from Delta, American, United, TWA, and other major air carriers, offers direct flights to and from all major metropolitan areas across the United States. Once you've arrived, it's a 15-minute ride to the headquarter hotel, the Radisson Metrodome, which is located on the U of M campus, 100 feet from the courts. The Radisson is a four-star hotel, and the rates for 1994 are $69 per night per quad. The secondary hotels are the Holiday Inn Metrodome and the Days Inn University. The Days Inn is less than five minutes walking time, and their rates are $57 per night per quad. The host committee is planning activities for spouses, such as day trips to the Mall of America, the United States' largest indoor mall, <laughs> to the town of Stillwater, a historic lumber town in our community on the uh, scenic St. Croix River, tours of the state capitol, four miles from campus. In addition, there are cultural events the world-renowned Guthrie Theater, the Ordway Music Hall, the Walker Art Gallery, and Sculpture Garden, plus numerous comedy clubs, theaters, nighttime entertainment opportunities in Minneapolis and St. Paul and on the Mississippi River. The University of Minnesota is in the Big Ten Conference. The campus has a student population of 58,000. Across the street from the Radisson is Stadium Village, in which there's a wide variety of eating and drinking establishments that'll fit your pocketbook. Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes and the vacation land of the north. I would encourage you to phone the Minnesota Office of Travel and Tourism to reserve a post-tournament stay for you and your family at a lodge, resort, cabin, on one of these scenic and numerous lakes throughout the state for fishing, boating, and other vacation opportunities. We encourage you to make these plans before the summer ends for next year. We can guarantee you Minnesota-style hospitality, a four-star hotel, a clean, safe, and fun environment. Uh, we have a few slides here we'd like to show you real quick. Uh, Rudy, could you dim the lights, please? Okay, welcome to Minneapolis, Minnesota, city of the lakes. To fly into the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport on one of the major air carriers. For shuttle service, we'll take you to your to the University of Radisson for the days in on the U of M campus. The skyline of Minneapolis. Nighttime in the Twin Cities, in the foreground, the glass atrium of the Walker Art and Sculpture Gardens. Holiday in Metrodome, very close to the university. The Metrodome, home of the Minnesota Twins and Minnesota Vikings. A shot of the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. Another shot of the Minneapolis skyline. 
<laughs> the atrium of the Gavaday Commons shopping mall in downtown Minneapolis. The Cricket American Contemporary Theater. A view of the skyline from one of its lakes in Minneapolis. Jogging path on Lake Harriet in Minneapolis. Mini Ha Ha Falls within the city. Famous sculpture garden in the Walker Sculpture Gardens. The Guthrie Theater. The Walker Art Center. An aerial view of the University of Minnesota campus. The walking bridge over the Mississippi River to downtown Minneapolis. Welcome to the Radisson Hotel Metrodome on the U of M campus. The headquarters for the 44th Annual Four Wall Handball Championships. You have arrived. Obviously these people aren't handball players. The hotel lobby. Standard double room in the Radisson. A standard king size room. And a suite at the Radisson. Fine dining at the Meadows Restaurant, which recently won a Silver Spoon Award. The Meadows Lounge and Piano Bar. McCormick's Bar and Grill, price range five to ten dollars. McCormick's Bar. The ballroom and banquet facilities. This is the entrance to the Radisson. Showing the distance to the recreation center, the construction area is now a parking lot. Aerial view from the eighth floor of the Radisson showing the recreation and aquatic center. Entrance to the recreation center. Shot of the glass back walls and viewing areas of the courts. Note that all glass is twin view white glass. Front walls poured concrete. Side walls are strong wall. Floors are Robin sport court, maple, sport, sport court maple floors. Each court has an independent internal and external sound system. The lighting is cool fluorescent. The two championship courts have 96 lights on each that generate 125 foot candles of light four feet from the floor surface. The other 14 courts have 78 lights generating 100 foot candles. The championship courts are wired for closed circuit television which can be shown on 15 televisions throughout the rec center. The rec center has an all-call public redress system for announcements and match calls. It's another view of the court lobby. A view of the courts looking toward the main lobby and staircases to the upper levels. A view of the championship court. Got a view of the second floor lounge where tournament control will be housed, looking into our aquatic center. This is the aquatic, Olympic caliber aquatic center, part of the recreation center. This was taken at the 1990 U.S. Olympic Sports Festival. A view of the tournament control area, looking towards the court area. Now leaving the recreation center, as the sun sets on the city skyline, we wish you a safe trip to your destination. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be your host on the 44th Annual National Four Wall Handball Championships in 1994. If you have any questions, I'll be around later on after the banquet. Hopefully I can answer some things for you. Thank you.